Great. Good evening, everybody. Um, my name's John Williams. I'm a soil scientist with ADAS in the UK, and it is my pleasure to introduce you to this uh, webinar, to welcome you to the webinar, uh, looking at the pros and cons of multi-species swords. Uh, the work presented today is part of the Super G project, which is a Horizon 2020 project looking at ways of improving the management of permanent grassland. Um, before we get going, I um, just want to go through some of the housekeeping. Hopefully most of you are familiar now <laughs> with, the, with the housekeeping rules with, with Zoom presentations. Um, all uh, attendees will be automatically muted, so you don't need to worry about making noises and things in the background. Um, we will be uh, having questions and answer uh, questions given to each of the presentations during the presentations, and it would be useful if you could put those questions into the Q&A function rather than the, the chat box to ask the questions. If you see questions there which you, you uh, think are more relevant, you can uh, upvote them so ahead of other people's questions so we get more of a chance of asking those questions by clicking the thumbs up icon in the, uh, the Q&A uh, function. If things happen with bandwidths and the like, or um, uh, the broadband kicks off or whatever, then often it's easy just to leave and rejoin and that should help uh, fix any issues that we have with the present getting through the software. Um, I hope you don't mind, but the webinar will be recorded. Um, and just to be aware of that so that anyone can uh, come and listen back to it at the later. And we will have a, a feedback survey at the end, which we will be very, very grateful if you could, if you could all fill in. Um, thank you very much. So that's all the housekeeping. And um, if we look at the agenda uh, this, this evening, uh, we have three excellent presentations. We're very lucky to have the, the speakers here tonight, very good speakers where we are going on a, on a mini tour of uh, Northwestern Europe, looking at the experiences and sharing experiences with multi-species sports, first in the Northeast of England, then we're crossing the Irish Sea to, to Northern Ireland, and then heading down to uh, over the channel to um, Normandy, and uh, where we will have presentations, each lasting around about 20 minutes um, to go through the experiences of these different sites. Um, we'll have uh, uh, question and answers, as I say, during the um, during the presentations, and also after the presentations, we'll have expert panel where we can have a discussion, which will include Claire Carres from uh, Normandy, James Drummond from uh, up in the northeast of England, there, Fridgen Jones from the uh, working up in Scotland, and Paul Newell Price from ADAS as well as Dale Orr from uh, Northern Ireland and David Patterson from, from AFBI. So uh, without further ado, um, we can go on to our first presentation from James Drummond and Paul Newell-Price, who are talking about the integrating herbs into grass clover swords at Lemington Hill Head Farm in Northumberland. Over, you, over to you, chaps. Thanks, John. Um, yeah, real pleasure to be talking today and just opening things up. I think we've got 20 minutes. We'll, we'll see how far we get in those 20 minutes and then stop, um, if not before. Um, yeah, so really we're, we're talking today and I'll pass it on to James uh, in a minute, but it's really talking about pros and cons of multi-species swords in the context of the trials we're doing at uh, Leamington Hill Head and the sort of general approach that James has to, to multi-species swords uh, on the farm. So from, from the researcher's perspective, um, our objective from the trial, at least, uh, which we'll come on to, is to determine the effect of selected, selected grass herb mixes. These are herb mixes that James has selected and, and particularly interested in. Um, so the effect of those on sward and livestock performance, but also we're looking at um, sort of nutrient management side of things. So the impact of uh, applying pea fertilizer on his um, low pea soils, plus um, the impact of a range of mineral nitrogen fertilizer applications. So we'll come on to that, but um, I'll ask James, first of all, to sort of give, give his perspectives on the, 
the objective of the trial and, and his general approach. Um, hello, everyone. Yes, so I suppose a bit of a background into why I quite like herb legume lays and why I'm using quite a few of them now. Um, few different reasons, really. Um, we're sheep and beef farmers here. Um, sheep's sort of the main enterprise, and we've got quite prolific sheep. And we've just actually started using a prolificity gene in a new line. So we're going to have a lot of high multiples on farm. So that's a lot of use with triplets, a lot of hogs rearing two. And the herb legume lays, when we first started using them sort of eight years ago, were a great tool to actually manage these animals. I don't want to be lifting them and rubbing on. It's a lot of extra work. I'd rather just be able to evaluate the genetic potential of the ewe. And to be able to do that, I want to leave all the lambs on her. And I don't want it to be my management that hinders her potential genetic ability. So we need to make sure we've got good quality pasture in front of them. And to do that, and especially the high multiples, um, these multi-species wards are really important. They're really good. Um, high quality feed during lactation. So we've noticed better performance from them animals on them. Um, not only slightly better improved daylight wave gain in lambs, but we get a lot better function in the ewes as well. So they've got the ability to, to keep milking and keep performing well on them animals. Another big part when we first got into these multi-species swords was the drought tolerance. The farms quite exposed in the east. We are northern, but we still do get quite dry weather, especially in the summer. And we're quite prone to burning off and quite a few of our shallow soils. So having these deep tap rooting species on farm is really important to help actually ensure we can keep pasture in front of them. What we do breeding wise, we've got to run quite a few animals on through the summer. We can't start Cullen early, we've got a lot of rams and replacements that go onto other people's farms. So we need a good supply of forage right throughout the summer. Grass grows well at this time of year, May, June it's producing, but it's not through the summer, especially dry summers. Whereas using these multi-species swarms, we can ensure we've got a good quality feed and a good growth in them pastures going into the summer. And that's really beneficial for us in our system. I started using them after going to New Zealand as part of a Nuffield scholarship, I saw farmers out there using them for hogget rearing, for high multiple rearing, really liked the idea of them. So when I came back, I went quite New Zealand approach in my mixes. So the picture we've got here is when we first started putting them in, it was a plantain clover lay. And this is what really got me into sort of multi-species swords. It started off quite simple, quite a few problems we found with it. It performed well, the live weight gain, the, the animal performance and the stocking rate was tremendous on it, but we had problems in wet conditions of poaching, um, the persistency of the plant here, plantain is very good the first couple of years here. It starts to die out in the third, fourth, the counts are all right, but they're not great. When we weren't sowing a grass species with them, we ended up with weed grass coming away. So actually you had to go in with a reseed once the plantain had died out. You had tremendous clover, but just weed grass so it wasn't really a, a viable lay so we sort of changed what we we're doing the mix started uh sort of tinkering with grass uh components in there what we we're putting in and actually that's gone from having quite a lot of diploids in to actually going now for more of a hybrid rye grass and a small amount of diploid we find that fits in quite well it gives us a good uh, boost of grass early season from the hybrid, but then actually that erect upright growth in the, the hybrids, actually it doesn't till it and try and smother out the other parts of the, of the lay. And one big problem we found when we started using these lays, like red clover, you get a lot of intestinal torsion, so red gut, some people would call it. And the problem with that is it's killing lamb. So they're performing well, there's always your top performers that get it, but there's just too much forage going through them too quickly and it twists the, the intestines and you get the torsion that kills them. So we started playing a bit of sandfoin a bit and the first year we used the sandfoin, absolutely tremendous, eliminated any torsions in the lambs. Problem we then found with the sandfoin was the persistency. You only get a couple of years out of it and it was the condensed tannins in the sandfoin that we found that was reducing the torsions. So these are also found in birds for trefoil and in chicory. So we've started playing a bit more with them on farm. And that's when we sort of met Paul and we got in 
to the, the trial plots with the Super G project. And now on farm, we've gone from that sort of initial plantain based lay to actually incorporating more species. So in our mixes, we put in the rest of the farm, we've got a lot of sand for a lot of birds at trefoil, chicory, and we'll put another sort of components in there. And we've dialed back that grass quite a bit. Uh, we're finding diploids. If you put too much diploid in to start with, it tillers and smothers everything out. So you need a very low amount of diploid just to fill in in the later years when other species start to die out. So we've tried quite a few establishment methods here on farm. A uh, lot of it's done direct drilling. Um, the very first lay we put in in 14, that was the last time we ever plowed or did any he heavy cultivation for these swords. Since then, there's been a lot of direct drilling into permanent pasture or into temporary lays. And we've actually, like the slide shows, put some in with a low rate of uh, a hybrid brassica. Um, we put this in later season. It works quite well to try and maintain moisture. The canopy gets up quite quickly on the brassica and we get a good moisture retention. It helps smother the weeds. We're quite weedy here. We get a lot of annual weeds and that could be a major problem with the, the multi-species lays. You can't spray them with anything. Um, so you're limited really in your options there. So if you can try and mitigate how many weeds you're going to get in the first place, it helps. So we put it in with either a hybrid brassica, like in these photos, we can use it to transition use off the herb legume lays onto their winter grazing when they'll be on a, a kale swede mix. It's quite a nice little period as they, they graze these plots just to transition. And another big way we put it in on farm is with alba silage. So we put in a low rate of oats. We put about 75 kilos to the hectare of oats as we establish our multi-species swords. And that gives a nice sort of boost to the establishment yield. And then you can go in, cut that. We do it very early, sort of a green silage. So before the grain gets uh, even watery, nowhere near milky. So it doesn't pull too many nutrients out of the ground and it gives us a higher quality silage. But the main thing that it does is you're taking out the annual weeds. We'll grow red shank, fat hen, chickweed for fun. Like we're tremendous at growing it and it's just a useless thing to have on farm. Uh, at least with that early cut, we're cleaning them up and it gives us a really nice clean lay afterwards. And that, I suppose, is one of the, the big issues with establishing multi-species swords. If it's going from a, we're not really conventional, but someone that was quite conventional, putting a lot of, of sprays on farm, there's there's nothing you do so you need to try and mitigate any of that before you establish a sward um if you're going into permanent pasture and it's been weedy i really would try and recommend sorting out the weed issue the year before if you can and then go into the multi-species swards there's a tremendous things to have but you are limited with options somewhat um some of the things we've really found with these since day one is the grazing management of them they have to be rotational graze the love of rest period they'll produce loads of high quality forage for you, but you need to be giving them a rest to enable them to do that. The picture we've got here on screen is what we've sort of evolved our mix into now on farm away from the, the Super G trial, which is essentially examining these components individually and looking at what performance benefits and persistency and, and nutrient management we need for each component, but put together in the sward, the birds at trefoil, that chicory plantain, um, a bit of sand in there for the first couple of years is sort of what's driving the uh, the multi-species mixes that I use now. Uh, we get tremendous animal performance on it and that drought tolerance really is handy. Um, I know some people have been wet this last week or so. We've had nothing. We're starting to burn off on a lot of the grass fields. It's a couple more weeks without any rain. We'll be struggling if we didn't have these sort of lays on farm. They can produce for us. They've got the tap root. They've got the... Uh, the mineral profile as well so you're going to help animal performance as well as getting that moisture up when there's not about and we can keep animals growing um a big thing as i said that grazing management they they really do perform better you get a lot better persistency if you're doing the rotational grazing we try and go for sort of a three-day graze but that is flexible on the time of year early season um just after lambing the most be grazing a bit longer once we can get mobbed up and get moving around paddocks we try and and keep it to quite a short grazing interval. And it helps the persistency. Animals will selectively graze on these. You're giving them a lot of choice and animals are picky, especially sheep. They will graze out certain species. Um, we've seen when we did leader follower systems with sheep coming in behind lambs, a high priority stock, 
they just selectively grazed exactly the same species and they, they hindered their persistency in the sward. Uh, we're doing quite a lot of leader follower now with cattle coming in behind so we put priority stock in front on these rotations that would be basically growing lambs or at the minute use a lactate with gram lambs at foot and we can reset that residual better and more evenly with cattle falling in behind so instead of trying to take everything down they will select certain components over others so instead of trying to get everything quite even with sheep we can come in with cows behind they just take a big mouthful they take a nice sort of even residual when they leave the paddock. So it, the cattle are quite good at our system. We have them. We didn't really have many before. We've upped the numbers just to try and improve our grazing management and the persistency of these. And it's kind of evolving what we do. The mix that we have here on farms evolving and how we manage them. But we have started increasing the diversity we're growing and certainly the, the cattle cleaning in behind the readers help the persistency of them. And what we've done with Paul, that's very much looking at persistency, although we've found a few things that maybe aren't great. And the main thing from that is set stock. And we want performance data from these trial plots. We have to set stock them for eight weeks to get that performance data. And I think it's shown just how much that set stock and hinders persistency on these. Uh, we put in five new plots, all the different mixes. I think Paul's going to touch on that in a second. And a track at the top. The persistency on the track has been a lot better than the plots because we just put animals in for a day every month or so to clean it up and it's still how it was sown and uh yeah part of the management is just getting it grazed right it's going to help your persistency a lot is there anything else you want me to touch on now paul or well, that's great uh, thanks thanks james I'll, I'll just take us through the um the sort of trial itself um so basically looking at the trial setup and then We've got a bit of data which pretty much just illustrates what James has been saying. Um, so we'll see how much of that we'll get through. But we've got some data to look at um, basically how well things established uh, last year and then into this year. Um, a bit a bit on um, effect of the nitrogen application rates on, on quality, uh, quality in the different blocks uh, and then effect of the phosphorus applications we're doing. But this, this slide just shows you the setup. So we've got got five blocks um five treatments um we've got this base mix which is the ryegrass white clover plantain uh, mix um james has mentioned and then we're basically superimposing so adding the herbs and legumes on top of that so this the second treatment was that base mix with sanfoin added to it the third one's got bird's foot trefoil added and then with the the fourth and fifth are basically playing on that a little bit so the, the fourth one is half rate of sanfoin and bird's foot trefoil with the sort of standard base mix. And then the fifth one was again, a uh, half sanfoin bird foot trifle, but halving, halving the, uh, the seed rate for the base mix just to see what effect that had. Um, so that's, that's what's happening in each of the blocks. Um, and then super superimposed on each of the blocks, we've got um, the phos phosphate application. So 80 kilograms of triple superphosphate or 80 kilograms of uh, phosphate per hectare as triple superphosphate applied to one side and not applied to the other. As I say, these are low P state of soil. So, so we wanted to see what effect that had on performance or on the yield, uh, but also possibly persistence of, of the herbs. Uh, then as well as that, we've got the nitrogen rates, the, the four different N treatments. So no nitrogen, 40 kilograms of N, 70 and 100. Um, this is just showing um, some of the field team in action on the next slide, Sarah. Um, so, yeah, we, we, we set up uh, growth cages on each of the N and so on the nitrogen and the phosphate treatment so we could keep track of grass growth and, and quality. Uh, James, I don't know if you want to say anything about more about the setup there, um, set up oh. to provide water. Clip yeah, so we, we split up <laughs> after we sowed the plots. Um, so Steve, as part of the project, came in and uh, GPS the, the trial plots. Uh, we got them direct drilled, two passes um, to give a better coverage of the, the sown species. And then we split up with Clipex, sort of permanent fencing pretty much, but it's quite quick to put up and got the water infrastructure put in place. As Paul said, um, there's the, the P and no P, half of each field. The results are quite good in that last year, so we've randomised that this year. And the four 
treatments of nitrogen throughout the year. So there's cages on all of them sites on all five of the plots. Animals that say will graze and you've got to get on the cages quickly because if it grows out the top, they'll graze through the cage as well. But um, we can see the, the preference, we can see what's grown in the cages and what's actually left in the field and also get a, a yield of what's been grown as well, having them exclusion cages there. Great, okay. So we'll have a quick look at some of the data. I'll just whisk through these. Yeah, so, so first slide, just looking at um, establishment, we've got pie charts for each of the, the treatments, the five blocks with the different species mixes in them, just split by uh, ryegrass, clover, the sown herb, proportion of the sward um, that is the sown herbs and then other species. So you'll see that um, good amounts of ryegrass and clover as you'd, as you'd, as you'd expect. Uh, the, ha the hatched is the sown herb. So we can see that in the samphoin, uh, but more so in the bird's foot trefoil block, we're getting decent amounts of um, sown herbs in, in that first year to, to June. So we're talking establishment was autumn, so late summer, autumn 2019. This is June 2020. Um, but yeah, the, the best the best uh, blocks in terms of establishment was with the bird's foot trefoil and, and the samphoin sown on their own. If we go on to the next slide, this takes us through to um, May this year. And as James was mentioning, we've, we've set stock so we can get the livestock performance. And this has had an effect on persistence. So if we just click through the, the pie charts here, they should come on. Um, yeah, so click on again. It's showing the change from 2020 to 21. You can see by May this year, um, there's not much of the sown herbs left. You can see in, in the BFT top right, 3% of the sword is, is bird's foot trefoil. So there's a bit of bird's foot trefoil there. Sanford seems to have gone uh, and not much persistence on, on the other blocks. So yeah, this, this does seem to be an issue uh, where, we're, where we are set stocking. So, so worth bearing in mind. Move on to the next slide. So just a little bit about quality. So this is looking at um, results by um, June last year, so early season last year. No difference in yield between the different blocks you'll see on the left there. That's just uh, kilograms per matter per hectare. And then on the right, no difference no, in digestibility, digestibility between, between the, treatments. the treatments. And then the next slide. Again, no difference in ME or crude protein between the treatments. So um, they, are, they are performing in a very similar way across the board. I'll go on to the next slide. So this is just looking at total grass yield for the whole season in 2020. So look, look across the, the cuts that we were doing in the grass growth cages from sort of June right through to end of September. It looks as if those... Um, those plots or those blocks with the herbs in them are doing better than the grass clover plantain base mix um, over the whole course of the whole season. If we go on to the next, next slide, this takes us through to 2021. So at the moment, we've just got fresh weight yields and waiting for the dry matters, but it's showing a similar pattern in that the, the herb um, blocks to, you know, across the board seem to do a bit better than that block with the grass clover plantain base mix. Uh, next slide. So moving on now to looking at the effect of the nitrogen. So this is again is total grass yield for the whole of last season in 2020 and the effect of the different N rates is just showing that unless you get to 100 kilograms of N per hectare it's a pretty similar total grass yield because as, as your N rate increases the influence of the legumes reduces probably. Uh, but you're getting that slightly higher yield at the, at the higher end rate is the, the general pattern. Next slide. And then uh, again, looking at uh, this year's results. So this is early season growth, cold April, um, uh, cold dry April, cold wet May, meaning we're not getting much nitrogen through from the legume content, clover and legume content is showing quite a, quite a, response there from the 40 kilograms of N that was applied. So you've got the the N and the 40 N uh, treatment in each block showing you a pretty consistent response to that early season nitrogen. Um, moving on 
next slide. So yeah, this is this is just showing the effect of the nitrogen application rate on the species mixes. So yeah, despite these N rates up to 70 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare, it doesn't seem to be having a big impact on the clover content or the sown herb content in, in that first year. Um, and the last one on N, is it? Yeah, so last one on nitrogen, um, in terms of the, the, the nitrogen rate, didn't seem to have an effect on ME, but did seem to have an effect, if we look on the chart on the right, crude protein by nitrogen treatment um, for early season grazing, the higher nitrogen rate seemed to uh, improve or, or increase the crude protein um, in the sward. So quite a lot of data that just picked out a few bits and pieces there. I think we've got one more now on phosphorus. So this is an interesting one. Again, this is setting out the P response by block. So we've got total grass yield on the y-axis, P0 compared to 80 kilograms of phosphate per hectare. And you'll see consistently by block, we're getting this response from the P application. It's a split field um, layout. So a bit suspicious, this might be a sort of uh, a sort of field effect, which is why, as James said, we've now randomized it for this season to see if we get the same effect from the P application this year. Next slide. Sarah. Yeah, so I'll I'll pass on to I'll pass on to James for the livestock performance if we to finish off. Yeah. No time for that, John. I uh, just quick, quick couple of minutes, James. Um, <laughs> that'd be brilliant, mate. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'll be quick on this. Um, well, it says it on the graphs there, really, yeah, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, how we performed each block. Uh, eight week weights on the lambs were performing better where we had the birds, but trefoil. Uh, looking at that, the poorest one was uh, the one with the standard grass and the half grass. And then actually, the, the Sorry, clock. <laughs> the kilogram gain per hectare was better on the birds for trefoil as well. And I think them results were repeated this year as well. We did eight week weights about a week ago. Um, they outperformed on the birds for trefoil plot, both I think in stock and density and live weight gain per animal and per hectare. So birds for foot is doing quite well so far. Brilliant. Thanks very much, James. Thanks, Paul. Um, I'm wondering if we if we take some of this discussion further on into the into the Q and A at the end. Yeah, we can cover that. Um, no problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cover that. I mean, that's obviously a very important part of the project to to discuss the performance of the animals at the end of the day. So that's that's something for everyone to hold back on and think about um, when we have the Q and A, if that's okay. Um, but that's great. Thanks ever so much. Um, there's a couple of questions in the Q and A, which again I think uh, for the uh, consideration of time we'll we'll take those in the uh at the, at the discussion session um at, at the end of the presentation so moving very swiftly on if we could move to cross the cross the irish sea over to beautiful county down and david patterson and, and dale or will uh, will take us through their experiences over to you gents hey. Thanks very much for the introduction. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, tonight, what I would like to do is take the first 10 minutes or so and look at the, the theme for tonight, the, the pros and cons of multi-species swords from the research perspective and bringing in some of our, our, our recent um, AFB trial results. And then we'll swing over and, and bring Dale Orr into the equation and we'll look and, and hear from him as to his practical experience at farm level and how he has incorporated successfully, or, or, or not, as the case may be, on some occasions, into his organic farm system in, uh, in Strangford County Down. Okay, thank you. So just some of the pros that have been frequently outlined, and you, you, you've probably all seen some of these before. Um, the, with with multi-species swords, there's opportunities to extend the grazing season, increase the productivity. Uh, the more resilient swords improved carbon sequestration, Reduced need for fertilizer, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and animal benefits there in terms of uh, parasite control and uh, environmental benefits in terms of uh, greater biodiversity both above and below ground. Thank you, Sarah. And some of the research I'm not going to go through a lot of the different uh, areas uh, being researched right now, but uh, research that was done in UCD in Dublin, 
which AFPI was involved with as well, it was the, the, the Smart Grass project or Smart Grassland Systems, where they looked basically at lots of different combinations of mixtures of grasses, legumes, and herbs. On the next slide, you'll see some of the, the these studies were largely done in the early stages anyway with, with sheep grazing. And there was um, very, I've grossly over summarized the findings from that, but there was less animal medicines required, um, a higher yield of herbage with lower nitrogen inputs. And um, importantly, there was an increased or faster rate of gain by the lambs reaching market weight that bit sooner, uh, leading to greater profitability. I know Leo will touch on that later on. Thank you, sir. In terms of the animal health benefits, I'm talking there about minerals and parasites. Um, the plantain can, can, can bring up and draw up higher levels of, of calcium and cobalt, for example. Chicory is higher levels of magnesium and zinc, which is all good. And there's also good research coming through in, in our literature review that we're doing at the moment. Chicory and bird's foot trefoil, which you've heard a lot about already, um, ribwort plantain and yarrow can all um, have all been reported in different trials to um, show a reduced parasite burden, uh, at, at least in, in sheep. Next slide. In terms of the soil health, what's going underneath the surface? Um, we, we, we had a, a PhD student, Chris Broughton, uh, last year, he was doing studies below ground on worm populations, uh, both at AFBI uh, and some of our grazing studies, and down south at the Devonish site in Douth. And what he found basically was that there was a higher earthworm uh, abundance um, underneath the multi species swards when compared with uh, nearby reseeded or permanent pastures. And it was these anisic species, the, the ones that are the the, the long, deep, vertical burrowing type worms. And the, the, there was more of those in particular, which is great because this species is the one that contributes more to you know, improving soil hydraulic conductivity and its nutrient cycling and improving the, the, the soil structure. So again, all very positive, but early preliminary findings. Again, um, thinking of early preliminary findings, um, our, our EcoSward trials down at Loch Gaul, these were established back in autumn 2019. There was two trials there, two very simple trials. One was simply looking at the yield performance of individual component species. So we had, uh, and you can see in the photograph there, we have individual plots of um, pure plantain, pure chicory, pure, pure grass uh, varieties, and pure clovers. In the, second mix, in the second trial, it's a mixture comparison, and we'll, we'll maybe touch on that in a moment just to speed up. Go to the next slide, please. So the trial details in terms of establishment, and I think this is important with the theme tonight of establishment and management and so on. Um, these were sown into clean ground, and, and James has really been referring to the, the importance of getting the weed control sorted out before the multi-species go in. But we had conventional ground preparation in terms of plowing and then shallow drilling, trying to get the seeds into that top sort of one centimeter or 10 mils of the, 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 uh, the top soil surface. Fertilizer was relatively modest right across the trials, um, about 80 kilograms of nitrogen uh, applied in the spring across all plots. And the grass only plots got a top up uh, later on in the summer of another approximately 70 kilograms of nitrogen. Simulated grazing was, 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 was the treatment or the, the defoliation uh, practice and that we're trying to mimic uh, grazing by using that holdrop harvester that you saw in the photograph. Eight harvest, at least eight harvest across the season. And importantly, we're, we're grazing, <laughs> we're cutting at uh, 15 to 20 centimeters down to about seven, seven and a half centimeters, but doing that mechanically. Um, the, each grazing, the number of grazings started off on the 27th of April. We had, uh, I think, eight grazings in 2020, um, finishing off on 28th of October an average regrowth interval, which is important back to some of James's points, 26 day regrowth interval, sometimes longer, sometimes shorter, it was dictated by the height of the herbage when exactly we took a cut. There's some interesting uh, research I was just uh, re reviewing last night actually, and it was the first time I'd come across it, I don't know why I haven't seen it before, um, but the, the, the New Zealand targets for, for first time grazing on a newly established ward I think it was uh, wait until six leaves are, are present on the plantain and seven leaves are present on the chicory plants. 
because this gives them a, a better opportunity to establish, especially in that first uh, uh, establishment phase. Um, next slide, please. Just to show you some of the photographs of what these uh, pure stone plots actually looked like, looked like a tall fescue one on the left hand side and a white clover one on the right. Next slide. And the plantain in particular, you can see they're shot from two different angles, um, established tremendously well. Um, there were harsh uh, post-sowing conditions in that particular trial uh, in, in autumn 2019. The trial was sown in early September, first week of September, um, but the, the plantain and all of the grasses and most of the clovers all established uh, surprisingly well. And one year further on, this photograph on the right-hand side, taken from a slightly higher angle, shows you that plantain grown singly um, by itself and suffered very little in terms of weed grass invasion or, or, or broadleaf weeds for that matter. Next slide, please. This is some of the cons coming in here. Pure sown chicory didn't fare so well. Um, maybe we should have looked at the uh, slightly higher seeding rate, um, but I think that the bigger factor was probably uh, it just did not like being sown that late and took a, a, a long, would take a, a longer time to establish. And you can see even from that distant shot there that there was a lot of annual meadowgrass, um, wheatgrass invasion came into the plot. And by comparison, the tall fescue plot just shows you that exactly the same location, same conditions, um, albeit slightly harsh conditions post sowing. Um, a grass is still you know, very reliable in terms of its ability to establish and thicken up over the course of a year. Next slide, please. Some of the early results, these are just preliminary findings. They're only fresh weights taken from 2020 season, but you can see from all of the, 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 the bars across, the bars mostly to the left-hand side are dominated by the, the herb components, if you want to say it that way. And um, the bar finisher is a no grass mixture. That's purely red clover, white clover, and herbs. The tonic plantain right beside the bar blanca and the commander chicory are the, 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 relatively speaking, the higher yielding plots right across the eight cuts of the 2020 season. And the grasses, as you can see, the light green bars over towards the right hand side, as a group, there's not much difference between them, but um, poorer yielding, and I put a fair bit of that down to the late dry spring that we had in 2020. Okay, next slide, please. In the mixture comparison, went in at the same time, same condition, same establishment method. The only difference in mixture A and mixture B in this uh, uh, second trial is the addition of the tonic plantain and commander chicory that you can see in the seed rate on the right hand side there. Next slide, please. And over the eight cuts uh, in, in, in last year in 2020, quite a substantive difference there in terms of uh, just the, the, the herbage produced. Um, mixture B, the, the inclusion of the herbs seemed to have a dr fairly dramatic effect in terms of the, the, the sward production. And on the next slide, you'll see the first two cuts, only two cuts from the 2021 season um, in April and May. And you can see there straight away the red and blue is first and second cut, but mixture B again is out yielding the mixture A. So these are all preliminary results. Um, we haven't had years and years of, of, of data to, to show here tonight, but there's early indications of the, the, what we've already heard from the previous speakers, the, the additional herbs going into the mix is adding to the herbage production ability. Okay, next slide. And partly to explain that, this is a, a very over, oversimplified diagram of the growth patterns of grasses, legumes, and herbs. But you can see straight away that if you don't have um, a, 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 a normal production curve from the grasses, especially in that spring period, which is what we've experienced here in Northern Ireland in 2021 and previously in 2020, um, if you don't have that um, burst or boost of grass, early in the season, well, then you're, 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 you're having to rely on the legumes and the herbs filling those gaps, so to speak, and giving a good supply of, of herbage production for the rest of the season. And I think that largely explains the, the, the yield graphs that you've just seen. Okay, next slide. Quickly moving on, this, the, the, the two grazing studies that we've started here at Hillsborough and at Loch 
we have exclusive uh, we're, we're groups of cattle and in the Loch Goyle case uh, hoggets there. We have exclusive groups which stay on either the grass clover or the grass clover herbs. See in the next slide. Just some of the botanics that we've been doing um, just to get us uh, going on this trial. In the grass clover sward uh, in April of this year, these were sampled. <clears throat> And don't get me wrong, this is a very good grass clover sward, 81% ryegrass, 17% clover, um, just 2% weeds. But in the next slide, you'll see that uh, sitting side by side with that, um, in the multi-species sward, slightly lower grass level, slightly lower white clover level. And that's being largely replaced, obviously, by the, 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 the herbs. But in particular, the plantain is, is the strongest component there, with 6% from the dry matter. Um, contributing from plantain and just one percent from the chicory, and that's maybe one of the cons that we're we're starting to develop in this story here tonight. Uh, the chicory is maybe the one we're, we're we're really wanting to keep in this ward, but we're struggling. Okay, next slide. And from the animal performance point of view, again, this is very early data, but there's about five or six weighings have been done so far this spring. And in that April to June period, the uh, those dairy-born calves that you saw grazing on the uh, on the trial um, are gaining about 1.28 versus those that are on the grass clover of 0.92. So we'll see how that develops, not only over this season but in the coming years to get really strong data on that. But the early indications are are good in terms of animal performance, which is obviously very important. To conclude this part of the talk, I just want to counterbalance some of the, 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 the pros that, that the research is showing. Um, but so, some of the cons that I'm picking up on here, and just, this, just to stimulate some discussion later on, there's, there's basically a lack of long-term studies uh, done on multi-species right around the whole of the, the UK and Ireland um, at this point in time. And there's a lot of studies that have started off, like our own, and we're, we're showing preliminary findings. But it's, it's, a, it's a world apart from the, 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 all of the encyclopedic knowledge we have of grass swords and, and all the trial data that we have in play. Um, we need to better understand the mechanisms involved in terms of uh, this question about overyielding whenever you combine more and more species together um, and the growth cycles that are involved there, the carbon storage, the, the persistency, which has already been mentioned by others uh, tonight, uh, the nutrient supply issues. There's lots and lots of things that we don't know um, and we need to understand these mechanisms to be able to predict and, and develop management blueprints for farmers in different locations, et cetera, et cetera. And in terms of practical issues, there, there's no one standard multi-species sward type. There's ones with three species, six species, um, 12 and beyond. You know, so it's, it's hard to find one standard uh, multi-species sward to compare with. And, and that is a slight criticism as well. Um, and also re-establishment of herb species, we, we, we haven't even really got there. Uh, at this point with, with the, the lack of years in some of these studies. Once the persistency starts to fall off of a particular species, what are you gonna do? We need to develop ways and means and un an understanding of how to get those species re-established back into an otherwise healthy sward. There's questions about silage making and weed control as has already been said. I'll finish there just with that impact uh, message at the bottom. And that's just to tease some discussion a wee bit as well. Um, overall, there's, there's, a, there's a relatively low rate of reseeding in Northern Ireland um, across the grassland area. I think it's only about 3.8% of the grassland area per year across farms in Northern Ireland. Maybe not that much difference around the UK, um, but if you think about multi-species swords coming into that, they could end up just being a niche within what is already a relatively low amount of reseeding taking place. So that's kind of a, maybe it's not a con, not a criticism of multi-species swords, but it's, it's sort of a reality check in terms of the, uh, the, the potential impact of these swords. So on the next slide, this is my marker to bring in Dale. <laughs> um, I just wanted to finish on the establishment point there. Um, that was a sword that we showed at Loch Gaul, which shows similarly what James was talk, talking about earlier, um, the, the, the plethora of, of, of broadleaf weeds that we can also grow um, with a, a, a multi-species sward. The photograph on the right shows me trying to rescue a little chicory plant, um, but there's plenty of red shank and all sorts of other plants around it. So the, the solution in this particular field was to get sheep in to have a, a, a short 
um, uh, abrupt grazing with, with lots of mouths on the field per acre to get a lot of that, that, that uh, competing uh, broadleaf weeds decapitated and removed and then step, step off and let the sward get fully established. But anyway, I'm bringing Dale very, uh, just at this point in time, just to broaden out the discussion from a practical point of view. Maybe Dale, could you tell us just a little bit about your, your farming setup? Okay, yes, thank you very much, David. Um, I farm approximately 200 hectares near Down Patrick County Down. Uh, we converted to organic farming in 1998 and we're constantly learning how to maximize our organic production with the use of minimal inputs. We keep a purebred clean flock. This year we land 390 ewes and 90 hoggets and we keep 100 traditionally bred suckler cows whose progeny we finish as beef. We are currently stocked at about one and a half livestock units per hectare. I appreciate this may be, may be regarded as quite a low stocking rate, but my philosophy is to maximize profitability by minimizing all inputs. And I find that our current stocking rate allows us to achieve this. In 2020, our carcass output was 33.8 kilos per yo, and our gross margin was 889 pounds per hectare. Again, I don't know how these figures compare with other farms, but each farm is different and we only use our benchmark figures as a target for our sales and then aim to improve against what we did the previous year. Generally, the gross margin per hectare is higher for the sheep. And this is due to the fact that they can be kept outside in grass all year round in our farm. And uh, we can winter them on turnips and kale and very silage is required to feed them. In 2020, less than 90 silage round bales were required to overwinter the breeding sheep. The farm's divided into two blocks. Churchtown Farms, our home farm, is 127 hectares, and it's pretty much one block of land with the farmyard centrally located. The fields are subdivided into paddocks for rotational grazing, and the average paddock size is around five acres. The land could be described as free draining, like clay soil, with the rock not too far away. It can be grazed with sheep all year round with minimal damage and the cattle generally graze around 220 days of the year. Uh, we lease 77 hectares. It's a single ring fence block of land located about two kilometers away from the home farm. It's known as the Mara Estate and it would be slightly heavier land than our own farm. There's less stones, but there's more soil. It too can carry sheep all year round but it would only be capable of carrying cattle for about 200 days of the year. Again, the, all the fields have been subdivided to facilitate rotational grazing. That's great, Dale, thank you. Um, there's a slide that's popped up there just to show your, 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 your net data from that location, just for uh, the audience's benefit. You can see there, I think straight away, the, the, the point you were making, dry springs, March, April, and May, particularly low rainfall levels for, for, for Northern Ireland, maybe for other standards as well, and typical temperatures in the spring, March, April, getting into that six, six or eight degrees whenever the, the, the herbs will, will, will start to grow. But could you briefly describe maybe um, the sort of species that you've used over the years before we've got into the, before you got into the, 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 the multi-species swords? Sure. Um, we've been organic since 1998, so we're using crop rotations and we reseed about 30 acres every year. The majority of the fields in the farm would be a dual purpose white clover lay containing a mixture of perennial ryegrasses and different sized leaf white clovers, such as Aberswan, Aberdye, Alice and Aberace. We have a small number of fields with a highly productive silage red clover swords with intermediate perennial ryegrasses and persistent red clovers such as Aberclaret and Aberclianti. And then the rest of the farm now has been established in these MSS swords. I think that slide showing there is your, was that the first? Yeah, that's, that slide um, shows uh, our first MSS sword. And um, we established uh, 25 acres of this in 2018 and we used oats as a nurse crop. The mix was established after a crop of stubble turnips and it was sown in late May. And although it was slow to establish because of the particularly dry summer in 2018, we still managed to harvest uh, a crop of silage bales at the end of August. 
and then we grazed it in mid October with cattle until the end of October. Noticing there, you, you have a good, you have a generous amount of pink and and uh, voice chicory in that particular case. I think that there is a lesson to be learned there in getting a generous amount of uh, seed into the mixture in the first place. But mm -hmm. how did that sword perform? And um, before we we'll quickly move on, um, well. Uh, 2019 really was the first year that we could measure a, a full year annual performance and we grazed it initially with sheep and then in June we had to add, add a batch of in calf heifers because to tidy up the paddocks after the sheep in a leader follower system because the sheep were starting to leave the grasses behind as they were preferentially eating the clover and the herbs. I calculate that the field produced just over 11 tonnes of dry matter per hectare in 2019 because the ewes with lambs were grazing it from the first week of February, and then the end calf heifers they were added, and the, they were added in June, and they weren't off it until the twenty eighth of October. And uh, have you tried other established methods and, and, and mixtures since then? Yeah, for the, for that established method, um, we we applied it and we par hard it twice. We rolled it before sowing, and then we rolled it after sowing. But the following year, um, we didn't ply at all. We just par hard twice, rolled, sewed, and rolled, and that worked equally well. We didn't, we didn't really need to ply. Um, in, 20, in 2019, instead of using oats as a nurse crop, I used Red Start as a cover crop. And the reason I did this was I, I was already seeing the benefit of the lambs growing really well on the Herbalay or on the MSS. So rather than waiting um, to take a cut of silage, I'd rather get in and graze it really fast. So we used Red Start of the cover crop and we were grazing it within eight weeks of sowing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, I think there's another mixture just about mm -hmm. to show up. Yeah, could you quickly just take us through that one? I know that's the, 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 the very newest or latest one that you're trying. Yeah, that, that's, so that's the latest. What's the thinking behind that one, please? Yeah, well, that, that's the latest one. We've had three three dry springs out of the last um, five years, mm -hmm. and it really impacts on, on the grass growth in this region. Um, we need as much forage as possible to keep the, the animals going, and really our philosophy is to get the most that we can from grass. So the reason I'm trialing this, I'm with 14 and a half acres of it just in this year, and these are all deep-rooted grasses, the Coxfoot, the Metafescue, and the Timothy, and obviously the red clover and the herbs are all deep rooted. So the reason for trial in this is to, to really get a drought resistant sward that'll give me grass when I need it in the dry spring. Brilliant. Uh, David Dale, this is fan fantastic. I'm really sorry to, to kind of rush you along. Um, I'm just wondering if we have another couple of minutes, uh, yeah. if there's any specific details you want to get across before we get into the discussion, which we can pick up a lot of this, because it's really useful stuff we're hearing here. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, yeah, just in the uh, consideration of time. There's loads more here, John, but we, have, we, we can save it to later on and maybe preempt some questions that will come up. Dale, just to finish with, um, what would you say are the cons? Well, we've heard lots of pros and I've, I've echoed, and we're both big fans of these multi-species sports for various reasons, but what would you honestly say are the cons? What's the downsides of these swords? Well, the biggest, well, there's a number of cons to these swords. Number one, it's weed control. We have a consistent problem with thistles in the MSS, especially in the year of establishment. Yeah. Um, also, they require really good rotational grazing management. Um, they're not suitable for set stocking, especially with the sheep, as they preferentially eat the herbs, especially the chicory. And they would remove it from the sward in the first year if they were given the chance. They require a different rotational grazing management to what most people are used to. You need to leave at least seven centimetres of the forage behind, and you need to let the sward grow to at least 12 centimetres tall before you let the animals in. Furthermore, with sheep, you need to let them have MSS every single day. Their performance suffers if you alternate between different types of sward. They don't, this doesn't seem to be an issue with the cattle, but with the sheep, it really impacts their performance if they're, if they're moved between different types of swords. Furthermore, the percentage of the herbs in the sward does decline every year, especially the chicory. 
The plant here with us seems to be pretty persistent, but the, the chicory does fall year on year. And obviously the grass seed's more expensive. It costs about 30 pounds more per acre to establish, which for a lot of people is a lot of money. Absolutely. And, and I think we'll be half to draw to a close there. Otherwise, John will um, <laughs> going off moment with the, he'll blow the whistle on us. But well, I'm really glad. <laughs> yeah, I'm really glad you, you shared your experience there tonight, Neil. And um, I think you've got a career in photography as well, because that's a super photograph <laughs> um, that we've just ended up with there at, at, at that last slide. So thank you very much again. Thank you. Back to you, John. David, David, that's absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much. That That is, you know, really puts it into context. The, I'm certainly getting lots of pros here, but um, it's nice to have a little bit of a uh, tip towards the cons as well, particularly when we come to the discussion later on. Um, just yeah just as a heads up again i'm not sure i explained it properly but we're going to have a um a quiz or, or a, a survey i think it's probably the best way of looking at it after the, after the next talk um one of these live quiz things that uh, i must admit my technology skills don't don't allow me to understand how they work but um there will be uh information on the slides and on the link in the chat as to how we participate in that but before we get on to that, I am absolutely delighted to welcome Claire Carres here from the Chambre d'Agricultural de Normandie, says in his, his Welsh-French accent there. So yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> looking forward to hearing very much about the multi-species sword in Normandy. And um, I'm sure we'll be able to get through before the, uh, before the, kick -off, the big kickoff at eight o'clock, Claire. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, you can pass, yeah. So I will present you um, a climate uh, platform. So it's uh, a total of four platforms that we tested on um, grassland species in Normandy. Uh, four are specialized in um, cutting mixes and uh, one on grazing that uh, we'll focus uh, today. We do this, um, this mixes from a uh, good study uh, during three years. Uh, so we start uh, last year in 2020 uh, until 2023. Uh, it's situated on the west part of uh, Normandy at the uh, farm um, La Blanche Maison, which is an experimental uh, farm, a partner of the project uh, of Super G. And we tested different, uh, different species, um, or, uh, so the, the basis, English ryegrass and white clover, but also purple clover, which we call it first, but it's a uh, red clover, it's the same. Uh, tall face hue, chicory, uh, different density. Uh, you can pass. You can see uh, just some details of uh, climate on, uh, in this part, in this farm. Um, this specific is uh, it's Norman's car, cows. So Norman's cow is uh, really uh, well known for, for cream and butter. And the, in this farm, they have a large part of uh, grazing days, so from March to November uh, when it's possible. And uh, the monthly rainfall is, uh, is close to, to that you have in UK uh, because uh, the total of, uh, of year is about uh, 900,000 um, millimeters with um, a temperature very, very. Um, uh, same uh, during all year. And next, you, you see the, um, our trial. So we use three blocks of, uh, that we get repetition of uh, seven uh, so with uh, six mixes. And uh, these mixes uh, we study from the implantation. So we sit, uh, sit them on early September, on the 5th of September. Um, we study them all the autumn for the implantation, and then at, at the beginning of spring, so we start in April, uh, we simulate grazing by cutting every month or every three weeks um, to, to, uh, to regard the, the growth uh, uh, value, the food values, uh, fresh matter, and uh, also dry matter and sorting species. So the, um, the first mixes, M1, is the uh, really most common uh, mixes in Normandy, is English ryegrass and white clover. 
So it's uh, we put two white clover, one giant and one intermediate, and you can see um, how we how we grow uh, during uh, all uh, autumn and spring. M2 um, is a, a mix grazing and cutting. So we tested in uh, all the, um, the the cutting platform. Uh, it's uh, really interesting because it's uh, more resistant of, in a dry condition with a tall fescue, uh, red clover, dactyl, and lucerne. Um, and it can uh, get uh, the, the two possible seeds. So as you can see on the, the first year of uh, exploitation is that the lucerne uh, is really long to, to, to get uh, to get implant. So it's uh, the one that uh, was uh, less uh, important in, uh, in dry matter. Uh, M3 is um, uh, English ryegrass with a really lot of type of clover, uh, red, hybrid, and white, and also with, uh, in grass with tall fescue. So it's really interesting to get um, a mixes uh, with different species, but we said that uh, more than six species um, is uh, less uh, interesting because you don't uh, see all, all of them um, at, uh, at the end. And also red clover get uh, two, three years of exploitation maximum. So it's interesting that I have different clover. Uh, in this mix. Uh, M4 is uh, really close to M3, but uh, with different proportion and uh, more tall fescue and uh, red flower. Uh, and M5 is, uh, as uh, my colleagues, is a test with a uh, chicory uh, and uh, red clover, white clover and rye grass. So chicory is interesting, but uh, this cycle is really short. So in, a, in, a, in a grassland mixes, uh, it's important to, to really get really attentive uh, of when uh, you get uh, grazing or, or cutting. Uh, M6 finally is a, a mix, a Swiss mix. Uh, we tested with the, the society uh, MEAC and um, instead of our mix, get uh, blue grass or meadow fescue uh, in addition. On the next slide, uh, you see a uh, um, how we do with a, a different uh, uh, picture. And uh, we estimate three, uh, but it will be more four or five cuts um, in, uh, in spring and uh, summer 2021. And on the next slide, you, you see a, a graph. So it's um, the plus in March and May, it's when we, we do the cut. And you see uh, the precipitation, so how uh, the mixes react to the to, to precipitation and uh, especially a big storm that we get in April. Uh, and we see that um, the, on gross, uh, gross grass that um, M5, for example, with chicory have a really an important uh, reaction after a cut instead of uh, the one, the, the, the yellow one is um, ryegrass and, um, uh, and, uh, and, and white clover, which is really really stable uh, all the during all spring so it's the first year of exploitation so we really need to to get more information uh, on the on the autumn and on the second year on the next slide you see uh, how uh, in a fresh matter uh, at each cut so for now we, we get uh, four on a um, moment uh, which uh, mixes uh, have uh, more production and more biomass uh, for now, is the one with chicory M5, but uh, also the the M2 that I, I see in, uh, with lucerne is uh, more longer. So, and we, we saw that lucerne uh, is really interesting in dry condition in summer. So it can have really um, other other differences, and we will see at the end of 2021 uh, the total of uh, of dry matter. But in orange is uh, close to. 1.5 uh, tons of dry matter, and in, in green is more than uh, 2.5 per cut. On the next slide, you see, uh, so legend is not important, it's just the color, that uh, in green you have a proportion of grass, in blue the proportion of clover, and in red uh, Adventis. 
And so M2 and M3 uh, get more advantage, especially because in autumn, uh, they, it was longer to, to get a, a Lucerne and, um, and tall face queue, and we get a, a really a wet condition. Um, and on the second slide, you see a, a sorting that we do uh, at the, in May, in end of May. And after exploitation, after cutting, we reduce the part of Adventis uh, in uh, each um, mixes. And especially, uh, the, for example, the M3s that you, you see that they, they don't have uh, Adventis uh, now, really, weeds, for example. Sorry. <laughs> with the, are really reduced after cutting, and the clover and the, and grass are really in a large proportion now um, after um, after spring. So thank you, thank you very much uh, for attention. And uh, you see uh, the platform uh, in uh, which was a visit in the 10th of June. So it was a big event. We have uh, 600 person. So it was uh, the first event uh, and uh, after COVID. So it was really important uh, for us uh, uh, to present this platform and also uh, lots of um, technical, um, technical part. Thank you very much. Claire, that was excellent. Thank you very much indeed for that. That was, that was excellent run through and thank you for keeping to time. Um, hopefully we will get all get the opportunity to come and see your platform in <laughs> once the vaccines are, are completed and we're able to travel again. So thank you very much for that. Excellent. Well, here we go. Well, let's move on to the, uh, the the survey results and all the rest of it now. And we can see here the Mentimeter results. Yes. So everyone, and uh, some of you already clicked the link on the chat. Uh, so you can do this either on your on your computer or on your phone. Just go to menti.com. I click on the link in the chat. We'll go to menti.com and put in the code 66380549. So we've had 10 people already uh, respond. We're just getting our minute or two to see if anyone else wants to come on, uh, respond. So, yeah, we have a lot of um, uh, enthusiasts of um, 10 people, at least already on, uh, who have sown all these species towards three who are thinking about it. One person who is still to be convinced so far. So we'll give it our second and then we'll we'll move on. So a lot of converts here. Okay, I'll move on to the next question then. So what we've, what we've addressed to find out is what have you been so in on your farm? So we're going to ch start off with if you can put down and let us know what what herbs for those of you that have been putting in um, uh, herbs in your farm, what which of these herbs tickle that apply have you been putting on your farm? Yeah, no surprises there. Plantain and chicory are uh, the mainstay, but we have a few of the others all, all very popular. I think that's everyone answered, so we'll move on. What legumes have you sown? There's a bit of a, a broader list here, but uh, yeah, let us know. Uh, tick the boxes for which which of these legumes you've sown. Very good. Okay, I think that's. I think most of the people had about nine. Oh, there's another one coming in. A couple more. Very good. Getting our second or two. But yeah, so again, very interesting. Planting, uh, sorry, red and white, obviously the um the ones put a bit of birds for truffle with some sand uh, No discern, interestingly, um, but they were very interesting. Okay. Um, then what grasses have you sown? So even bigger list here. Um, let us know what you've done. Okay, no surprises. Uh, perennial and Timothy obviously dominating. Some hybrid, 
bit of Coxford, Manifescu, a little bit of West oh, Westworld. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting one. Italian Meadow. Oh, very good. That's 11. I think that's all the numbers we had. So that's great. I'll move on. What we're interested in, why are you interested? For those of you who are putting in NSS, let us know. And you'll see a slider on, on your screen or on your phone, uh, not the fives, or sorry, not the 10. So just um, let us know, um, you know, score each of them as to why, how important they are for the reason that you're interested in, in MSS. Okay, so again, um, yeah, interesting. Obviously, drought resilience is probably the, the biggest reason. Oh, well, actually not anymore. Lower fertilizer use uh, and soil health. But yeah, it's fairly uh, evenly done across across all of those. So yes, yeah, thank you. And finally, what we'd like to know, because obviously we have a lot of um, scientists on the call here tonight, is what do you think of the R&D gaps? What would you like to see um, investigated um, I, by Super G or uh, the, the researchers on this call, what, what, what do you think uh, needs to be um, um, investigated? So if you can just uh, fill in you know, a word or two as to what you think um, you would like to, to look at. And that's great. Yeah, we're seeing obviously persistency, perhaps no surprising, the biggest issue, silage, um, uh, obviously your long term establishment, quality, anthelmintic, GHG. Yeah, a few things there. So, um, John, hopefully that's given you some food for thought for um, kicking off the, the conversation. No, that's fantastic. Thank you very much indeed, everyone, for taking part. Yeah. That's really, really useful in, in helping us form, form the debate. I think, um, well, first of all, thanks ever so much to the speakers for giving some excellent uh, presentations there and insights into the, the pros and the cons. As I say, getting lots of pros and, and quite a few cons as well. And um, I'd just like to introduce Rudian Jones, who's a, a, a livestock consultant up in the uh, up in the up in the north of England, Scotland area, there, who's got wide experience of managing um, uh, gra grazing management systems. And Fridian, I was just wondering, have you got any comments more on on some of the practicalities of uh, and the other things that people might need to think about in terms of establishing these um, these multi species swords? Yeah, thanks, John. Um, yeah, there's obviously. I've learned a lot tonight, funnily enough, because, you know, you hear about the cons as well as the pros and from practical farmers, that's very, very valuable information. And I think both Dale and, and James uh, put their experiences ac across very clearly. Um, you know, when I when I talk to my clients, um, the sort of default position, if you like, it'll be for lots of other consultants as well, is, is you have a, a perennial ryegrass, white clover sward, uh, yielding about 10 tonne of dry matter per hectare. Um, and, you know, are you going to be any better off for all sorts of reasons financially, mainly by having multi-species swords? Now, again, we, we've heard a lot of the benefits here. Um, I think Dale mentioned the fact that you need to have um, uh, quite enough of the multi-species swords so that the stock don't take a check when you move them onto something different, especially sheep. So it's, it's, it's finding this balance, I suppose, b between having enough, um, enough of, this, of these swords to get the benefit, certainly later mm -hmm. into the summer, 
uh, but not having so much that you can't graze them through the winter, which obviously you can't you can't uh, graze them like you could a, a normal grass lay in in the winter. So it's it's finding what suits every farmer and every farm uh, the best. I suppose that's the main thing is what's the optimum amount of of these swords that you need mm -hmm. to have um, to to give you the best effect on your particular system. Brilliant. I mean, I, I wonder, James and, and Dale, if you wouldn't mind commenting particularly on how these swords are managed over the winter. That's one of the questions that came up in the chat. And, um, you know, how, how do the different swords react to the uh, um, somewhat challenging weather conditions? <laughs> you know, obviously, James, it's uh, probably a wee bit cooler over with you and a wee bit drier than it is with Dale. I don't know if you've got any any comments there, James. First. Yeah, but you you still got to be quite careful. I cut out, unfortunately, when Vidya was talking, but he mentioned some very important things about transition there as well. Um, but the weather, yeah, you've got to be quite careful. We rest for a lot of the winter. Um, we actually tried making new lambs on it for the first time this year. Worked very well. Um, it depends how well you want your new lambs to scan. We had as many twins as we did uh, singles, so maybe it's a bit too well. Um, but no, that's the first time we've grazed it really late into the season. So that would be mating into um, sort of beginning of December with them. And then we'd rest until we sell grazed it pre-lambing. So with us, we're we're going over on a, a sort of a big mob in a small area. We'll go over that in March. If the weather is really bad, we'd actually drop off into... Uh, permanent pasture field so we want that sort of versatility if if the weather looks like it's going to be bad for a few days you're going to poach a very high value lay Oops. i think james, james has lost us there for a minute dale, dale i guess you're probably a wee bit wetter than than james where you are do you have um is 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 soil wetness and, and grazing intensity more of an issue there with you or would you be thinking about more of the droughts that we're seeing more and more of these days? Um, well, to be honest, our, our winters are, are, are pretty dry and we can graze our swords all winter long. My experience mm -hmm. would be very similar to James in that uh, we would uh, put our ewe lambs at top in time on the on the MSS. And again, our, our hoggets at lambing were never better. You know, they're, they're certainly bigger um, when, they're, when they're given birth, maybe three or four kilos bigger. Um, again, we would uh, top them and then maybe give them 100 days rest over the winter months and then use them for those hobbits pre-lambing because it's a very highly nutritional feed and it's really perfect for them because, you know, it, it is a really good feed and it means the intakes are strong and they're, and they're eating really good stuff. So that's how I would use them for topping and then pre-lambing and then whenever the lambs are six weeks old, then they go back on to the herbal lies again. Fantastic. Great. Yeah. And just to emphasize to everyone still listening that there's the Q&A still open and, and we'll keep going until at least eight o'clock. So if you've got any questions that you'd like to ask, please, please just drop, drop them in the Q&A and we'll pick them up. Um, I guess. Yeah. I mean, with the persistence, one of the important, I guess one of the important things is how, how long, how long the, the different species uh, stay within the sword, how the, how the sword quality stays. How long, how, how long would you leave it before you were looking to renew the swords, do you think, Dale? Um, so our first MSS was established in 2018, and the plantain is, is still pretty strong within the sword, but the, the chicory is the one that's very, very hard to, to keep, to maintain. Now, maybe our grazing management and our, our grazing wasn't perfect in the first year because we're still learning how to, to use it. And we were used, using our general rotational practice was we would top it down to four centimeters and leave the animals in and teed it, you know, the, the toppings the last day. Whereas now our practice is slightly different in that we're, we're not topping it half as often and we're only grazing it down to seven centimeters now because I don't think the chicory really likes that cutting low. And it, it seems to be in our 2019 and our 2020 swords, so we've definitely persistence is a whole lot better with managing the chicory better by not cutting it low and not cutting it as often as well. Brilliant. Brilliant. And um, in terms of establishing, 
when I mean, James, you were saying that you direct drilling. One of the questions we've got in from the uh, on the chat there is: is what depth would you be direct drilling, and is there anything special in terms of site preparation, spraying, you know, grazing off beforehand, whatever? Yeah, I hope I stay now. I keep cutting out, but I've gone onto a hotspot my phone, so hopefully I don't cut out. Um, yeah, no. site preparation. If you're direct drilling, take care of the weeds early. If you know you're going to put a GS4 or something like that in next year, take care of the weeds this year. Um, spraying off is quite good. Um, we find, as I say, we're quite bad for, for growing annual weeds here, so it's always a bit of a competition against them. Whatever we grow, if it's a reseed, a brassica, multi-species sward, you're always fighting against them annuals. Direct drilling gives us the opportunity to actually spray off and get quite a clean establishment there. Um, going quite shallow with the drill. It is a contractor's drill, so it's as shallow as he puts it in. Um, we find establishment absolutely fine, whether we've gone on direct drilled in a permanent pasture. In We've actually done a bit of pasture cropping. I've got some pasture cropping in at the minute, so we've gone in like no spray, which you're really in the hands of the forage gods when you do that. <laughs> um, but it does work. You've got to get your timings right that you need moisture for establishment. That's the most important thing because you're competing against grass. It's a very hard thing to do to try and establish diversity in grass without spraying. Some situations you can't. Soil erosion risks, rig and furrow. Yeah, uh, yeah. You, you use what tools you can to try and get diversity in them. But no big fan of direct drilling here. The main thing we've really seen over the years of getting these multi-species swords going is actually the time of the season we do it. We struggle later in the season up here. I know people down south, and Mary's Claire is different in France, um, but if we go late in the season, it's a big struggle to get them going. The earlier we go, the better um, establishment we get, the better plant counts we get, the longer that layer is going to be lasting us. Um, unfortunately, when we did the trial plots with Paul, we did some trial plots a year before. Um, we had real issues getting it in the ground. We were trying to go for early July. Um, the year before, the Super G project, we were putting some in, and it was just drought. Like We couldn't. We were putting it into dust if we tried to even direct drill. You can conserve moisture if it's there. If it's not there, you're not conserving anything. Yeah. Um, the year we put the Super G in, it was just constant rain and wind. So you couldn't spray off. You couldn't get on the fields and both them years we've gone in in August and up here you don't get the plant counters going in early. We've direct drilled as late as sort of mid-June here end of June and had really good establishment. Um, if we've aimed for a bit later than that generally something normally the weather has put us back a bit and yeah. that really does hinder. If we can get in early um, a spring uh, or May sort of late May ideal for direct drilling so in terms of, you know, in terms of renewal, you know, into, I'm just, obviously it's, it's a costly thing to do. I mean, the seeds, I guess the seeds not particularly cheap either <laughs> in no. terms of, you know, when, when you're establishing it. So when do you reckon the kind of trade off between persistence and, and taking the plunge and, and, um, uh, and going for a, a, a re a reseed comes into it? What do you, what's, what, what's the cost benefit of that? Do you think? We see how, it in how, long, how long would you leave it? How long were they in terms of the, the new lay was that or in terms of? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so the big cost benefit we see is that persistent high quality feed late in the season that we can't get off rye grasses. Animal performance, stock and density, live weight gain, and a huge increase in live weight per hectare because you're eating really high quality forage that doesn't go to seed. Apart from chicory or bolt and stuff in a second year onwards. But if you can manage a sward for that, you're generally always eating something that's very good quality and growing better later season than grass will. So your sort of return is in being able to provide high quality forage for finishing stock. Um, yeah, how you put it in the ground, we see a benefit that from direct drilling over your cultivation. That's, I suppose, a personal choice. I prefer trying to sort of preserve my, my soil health and... I don't know, burn diesel and wear a lot of metal, but some people love cultivation and it works on their system. It's great. If you've got my weed bird and it doesn't work, it's a pain <laughs> in the, that's a pain. Um, so we work with what we can. 
But um, there, so the cost, bear, as you said, the seed's expensive. So when you try pasture the crop and you're putting it in with ground you can't spray on, you, you want good establishment. I would say I put mine in a month later than planned this year. It was actually 13 months later. I've had the seed sitting there to do some pasture cropping. We didn't have the weather last year. To do that, we find we really have to hammer off a lay in the winter. It knocks it back in the spring, plunge it up. So we'll, um, singles will go on a field, sacrifice field, really trash it. If you can get that seed in and get it germinating quickly, it works. If you're trying to put it in an established lay, it's not really worth it. Yeah. You're not going to get it. There's too much competition. It will get smothered. Yeah. Okay. And that is a pricey thing to try. Um, <laughs> if it works, it's good. But I say, what's it? 30 quid if you're getting a contractor in to spray off a, a field per hectare. It's not the most expensive thing to do in, the, in terms of a reseed, really. Yeah. Just thinking about, um, uh, I mean, obviously, soil, soil um, nutrient status and all the rest of it's important as well. And one of the questions we've got in the chat, particularly for the herbal species, I guess, there's a little less information around, particularly for the soil pH. David, have you got any, any thoughts on that? Uh, I think it's, it's broadly similar to the pH requirements for legumes. You know, uh -huh. so you, you want to want to be up into that six point two to six point five. Uh, but let I, I know that I, I've come across some literature where I've, I've read plantain and chicory can tolerate slightly acidic soils. I wouldn't want to risk it. I would rather keep it up because the, the, the at the heart of the the, the multi species sward, the legume is like the engine. You know, so it's providing the nitrogen. If, you're, yeah. if you're, your objective is also to drive down your nitrogen inputs, <clears throat> you'll, you'll need that legume to survive. So I would dictate the pH answer by the legume requirement, 6.2 to 6.5, and I think that'll be adequate as well for yeah. the herbs. Brilliant, brilliant. And I guess, you know, soil type wise, James was saying about, you know, establishing it as, and, and timeliness and all the rest of it. They, Dale, have you, have you got any experiences of which soil types it's best to, to try with? Um, not really, to be honest. I, I'm sort of working with, with the one soil type. Um, and unfortunately, because I'm organic, I'm not allowed to, to burn fields off the way James does. But it works pretty well in my rotation. Now, um, I don't sow it till the... I sow it after stubble turnips that I use for, for, for winter in the use as well. And... Um, it works very well in my rotation. I just leave it till the end of April when the soil temperature is warm. Because if you sow it too early, you know, the herbs, they need the, a 10 degree soil temperature to establish. So if I leave it till the end of April, I'm sure the soil is warm enough. And then it really do get a good establishment. Brilliant. Right. Well, we've got, that's excellent. We've got James's, James's clock there is telling <laughs> us that it's time to come to an end. Didn't got quite mute in time, sorry. <laughs> um, I have potentially found one soil fertility issue. There's probably something I should run by Paul to see if it is. Okay. Paul mentioned we had pretty rubbish pea status across the farm. We've always got on really well with plantain. It grows naturally. We find it in the hedgerows and old permanent pasture. Like Dale mentioned, like one of our main ways of establishing it, if not in permanent pasture, is part of our rotation. So it follows beet. And for the first time, I've seen a sky high pea status on our farm because we followed beet that was grazed in situ and then we we're feeding silage. And you put quite a bit of pea on to feed the, the beet. It's all gone back into the soil. There'll be pea coming in from the silage. So we've actually got a field that's jumped from about two to indice five on um, pea. So it's really shot up within a couple of years. It's the first time I've seen or persistency on plantain on this farm. Everything else in the mix is doing all right, but on that particular block, the uh, the plantain has done poorly, and that's always been the one thing that stays all right on this place. Oh, so that will be interesting going forward to see if that's uh, that will have an effect on the on grown plantain, maybe other species as well. Yeah, no, well, this is it. anything that influences the availability of the phosphate is going to be of interest, isn't it? Because, uh, I mean, generally, it, it, it will, that will vary very much depending on the soil type and, and, and the nutrient status of, of, the, uh, of the soil and how the plants interact with the, um, with the pea, with, with the soils is going to be an interesting part of soil health. David there was showing all the impacts on on earthworms and the like as well but you know it'd be interesting to see what impact they're likely to have on the chemistry as well that's great 
But thank you so much, everybody. I've really enjoyed it. Particular thanks to Paul, James, David, Dale, and, and Claire for, for an excellent uh, presentation. Also for Sarah there for, for looking after us and keeping us to, on, on message with the presentations and everything. So thank you very much for that. Please, can you also um, make sure that we'd be very grateful if you could fill the survey, which will come out uh, straight away after the, after the okay. meeting is finished. And also thank you to Fidian very much for, for coming along and for, for Jason as well for all, all, all the help in preparing for us and getting it all together and for running that wonderful survey. So thanks every mu very much for everyone. Hopefully this has given you a flavor for the sort of thing that the um, Super G project is, is looking to develop. And it's brilliant that we've got the opportunity to share experiences, not just within the UK, but with our, our colleagues and friends in, in, in Europe and the, and the circumstances that they find themselves in, and we can learn an awful lot from that and um yeah wish you uh, uh very keep keep your eye out on the on the website and all the rest of it for more of these events and we'll be in touch again because we'll be repeating these events later on in the year and who knows hopefully we might even be able to, <laughs> to have a discussion in open field which which would be uh, wonderful before too long so um thanks ever so much to everyone and have a good evening and uh, hope France do well this, this evening, Claire, in particular. Yeah, oh, thank you. Hope Allez, for you, Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Excellent. Good evening. Thank you.